after the shipwreck, we sent our little 35-foot cruiser up to the New Hebrides and the Solomon Islands uh, to get another bird group, which we were also collecting for the Whitney Wing in New York, besides the music. On the third expedition, they, went, they flew out to the Dutch East Indies uh, and chartered a boat out there and sailed all through the islands with the guise of recording music, which thank God they did. But they were sent out by uh, President Roosevelt. He had, the year before, sent 12 young American flyers out to teach the Dutch how to fly in case there was a Japanese invasion. When they came back, we had a, um, a concert at Town Hall in New York to introduce the music on the original records. And Bruce and Sheridan stood up front. We had maybe be 500 people there to listen to it. And Andre Castellans was at his peak then, and he was very interested in it. And he wanted to take the and, and do something with them. Also, um, the Columbia Recording people were very interested in it. Well, th that was November, and December 7th came, and that blew everybody's wishes. So I took them back to Maryland with me, and I put them up in the attic over a pantry bar room, and there they sat till I brought them till my son started going through them in preparation to bring them up to the library. The Fonstock collection was one of the first major new acquisitions that arrived at the library um, just as I was arriving as Librarian of Congress at the end of 1987. And it was thrilling for me to see such a rich and uh, really a collection of very little known sounds and music and culture of the uh, what's now called Indonesia. Well, um, Indonesia is very interesting because it's a place of, of many, many languages, many scripts, many musical sounds, all of which are relatively little known even though they're part of the great Polynesian universe that is in a sense our, one of our closest uh, uh, Pacific neighbors. The Fonstock recordings are uh, extremely exciting find because most of them are the oldest recordings of any of the musics that they recorded from Java and Madura and Bali and the Kangean Islands. So it, it makes them uh, extremely important for us for that reason. The music all stemmed from my first husband's interest, Sheridan Fonstock, in music. He just loved it and he felt that it was going to be a dying thing out there and that's why he was so interested to get back there and start recording the native music from the different islands. So this was a wonderful collection and an inspiring one that Mrs. Lewis brought to us that one of the crisp autumn day that I'll, I'll never forget. Now what we see now of course is a uh, wonderful example of something that has been the main emphasis really of my time here as Librarian of Congress and that is what we say call getting the champagne out of the bottle, getting these wonderful collections, these unusual sights, sounds, texts, of which we have so many here with 105 million items in the Library of Congress, getting some of the most interesting, some of the most vital, some of the least known in many respects out to a much broader public. I knew that the time, the shelf life of these recordings were running out. I knew that they were decomposing as we were speaking, you know, and so that was, it was an urgent call that was answered by the, you know, by the library who saw the future of our, these kind of archives in a, a joint effort between the public and the private sector in order to get it out of the attics and the museums and libraries of the world into the living rooms and, uh, of the people. The Gamelan is a very special orchestra in which the instruments are gongs from four inches to maybe a yard in diameter and uh, as well as xylophones that are made up of either, their keys are either bronze or wood or iron, sometimes bamboo even. And they play together. Uh, always the instruments stay together because they're all tuned to one another, unlike a Western orchestra. Well, gamelan music is group music, it's group sharing. That's the whole thing about it, it's community building, it's what it's supposed to be for. Not only the sacred uses of gamelan, which, and they've created their own cosmology in music, it's like we say the mandala and sound is what they've done, but uh, it's a microcosm, it's, it's a way of life, and that's what this music signifies, the way they play it, the reasons behind it, the grouping of the instruments, uh, everything is, uh, and the sound, it's, a, it's a, a sound over sound kind of music. For someone 
uh, who knows nothing about this music, it offers something very intriguing. Uh, its cyclic nature one finds uh, as the original sort of new age music. It is extremely relaxing uh, in its cyclic nature, yet at the same time, especially with gamelan music, it's extremely exuberant. We had a, I guess it was about a uh, 12 by 14 foot radio room with all of the, all of the uh, uh, equipment in it. And then of course they had generators that they could take off the boat. But then we had two miles of wire that it could be recorded through. So no matter where these villagers wanted to settle, we could pretty much reach them. You have to realize that the electricity varied. So yeah, we had some extra generators to set up. For your more extra strength. generators <laughs> made the uh, the machines run at odd speeds. So <laughs> when we uh, realized that we were getting more than five minutes per side, which we shouldn't be getting at 78, then we realized that we had to bring them back to their original speed. So uh -huh. that was yet again one another, more another step, turn. And another turn in the adventure to try to restore them to their proper uh, sound. Uh -huh. You know, because they were they were running too slow. I had to find a way, first of all, to speed them up gradually until I felt they were a, a tempo or, or speed that sounded like professional musicians. In the process of doing that, uh, it also raises the pitch. And the first one that I did, when I raised the pitch, I said, oh my goodness, I have heard this ensemble before. And I then realized I had a recording of this ensemble. And that this recording, when I played back the recording through uh, my computer, and then played back the original font stock recording and slowly raised it up to the tempo that I thought was correct, they matched exactly. So not only had we found the name of a piece, we'd also found the exact ensemble. And the ensemble turned out to be incredibly important historically. Roll away the dew. Roll away, roll away to the dew. Roll away. Mickey, by his name and, and his visible public presence, I think helps get tens of thousands of people to allow themselves the opportunity of an adventure. You know, people want to adventure, but they're also shy. And sometimes they need somebody to say, try it. And if they try it, some of those people who try it will get lit up. And uh, so Mickey's role as a large public figure is to embolden more people to think, I'll try it. And, you know, uh, it's part of our birthright to be able to hear the world's music, not just what corporate America is playing on the radio. And that's, I think, a natural, that's a birthright that, uh, that someday will be uh, available to everyone. This is, this, goes, uh, this is one small step towards that. So this uh, venture is a really exciting example of getting the rare and unusual collections out to a much broader public, which will find them interesting for all kinds of reasons. The sounds are compelling, the, the story behind them are interesting, and uh, it's, uh, it cuts you in on a whole part of the human adventure and the whole human creativity that people haven't been exposed to before. And of course, the whole point of the folklore, the folk traditions, the folk sounds and music of the world is that they come from ordinary people and they should be gotten back to ordinary people, even if they're not part of their own particular culture, because we're increasingly, we're living in a global culture. And this is a, is a wonderful expression by some pioneering people, these two remarkable men who took those voyages around the, um, around the archipelago, what's now Indonesia, and gathered these wonderful sounds that might otherwise be lost to humanity. We started right now working full time. We'd, we'd be working at least our lifetime, and we wouldn't see the end of it. Because in a few years, some of the stuff that we're going to get to or not get to is just going to give itself up. It's not going to be able to be played anymore because of disintegration. Gamon is played for the beings of all three worlds. It's played for the gods of the upper world, for which it is a form of transportation to and from temple festivals and other important rituals. It's played for the humans and by the humans in the middle world for their pleasure and as an offering to the gods. And at the same time, the sound of the gamelan appeases the spirits of the lower world. So it is constantly 
not only imitating the cosmos, but satisfying all the beings of the cosmos. Well, it's just exquisitely beautiful.